James, welcome to The Fifth Direction. It's a real pleasure to, to, to have you here, my friend. Um, I feel, you know, we've, we've been connecting a little over, over the last months and uh, the opportunity to, to bring you on and, and introduce you and, and, and your work um, to our community uh, is a real pleasure. So thanks for being here. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure to speak with you. And um, I, I, you know, I feel honored that uh, there's, you have interest in my work. Uh, yeah, it feels really good. You know, we're um, on opposite sides of the globe, but there's that connection and the ability for us to actually have conversations and to um, have a peek into what other guys are doing around the world is really quite amazing and not something that was uh, so accessible to us just a few years ago. So. Yeah, I'm always blown away that, uh, you know, when guys like you reach out and say, I appreciate what you're doing and here's what I'm doing and we can have this exchange. It's remarkable. Yeah, you know, I, I agree. And uh, and your work really, really resonated with me. I felt like every time I saw one of your new um, podcasts drop, for, for example, it was kind of like somebody I'd been thinking about or, or a theme mm -hmm. I'd been thinking about. And, and there it was, Brian dropped something in my lap, which was kind of right on point. Um, so uh, go on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to comment that, um, someone else actually reached out to me today with that exact same comment that, uh, uh, every time a new podcast drops, it's right in line with what they've been exploring. And I think a lot of that has to do with the podcast being led by my own curiosity, you know, as I go along my journey and, um, follow up on some threads, sorry, there's some big machinery being moved down our roadway right now uh so you might hear that let me know if it gets distracting and we can just pause i can't hear it actually which is which is great okay good yeah they're working on our road right now we're on a little uh kind of country cul-de-sac and uh they've upgraded the highway and so they've been doing like lots of noisy work um okay as long as it's not coming through uh, but yeah, so the podcast being led by my own curiosity, uh, being able to connect with other people and hear from them just shows me that uh, when we're following our own curiosity, there's a chance that other people are also on very similar paths, maybe parallel paths uh, that intersect at certain points. And those points of intersection are points of like really deep connection. You know, you could think of it as the collective unconscious or uh, maybe a cul-de-sac in the collective unconscious that we just both happen to be exploring at the same time. Uh, again, just another affirmation that there is a, a network of deeper connection that we're all participating in if we're listening and paying attention, you know, to those urges and drives within us. So, yeah, it's great. Yeah, I, I really feel that to be true. Um, you know, tapping into something collective there. Um, it's a beautiful thing. And and it's good to see you had a couple of Australians on there too recently. Um, I, I know the, the conversation with David Tacey, I thought was was fantastic. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I really feel like David is one of our hidden gems. He's, he's written so many wonderful books. Um, um, his, his Jungian work is, is just incredible. Um, so mm -hmm. you... Um, Kind of giving him a platform to speak like that he has many but kind of to this particular community was was wonderful so thank you for doing that yeah i enjoy david uh there's an affinity i think between canadians and australians you know we're we're uh we're colonial nations we're still connected in some way to great britain you know we both have the queen on our money and i think there's something about being outside of the UK, but having those roots there um, gives us kind of an outsider perspective. Like I find um, Canadian comedians and Australian comedians to be the most kind of astute observers of dominant culture. Um, and I kind of like, we both probably grew up watching like Monty Python and things like that. And so there can be like kind of dry, sarcasm to our humor and uh one of the things i enjoyed about david is he's kind of like a crusty old guy uh he's not afraid to tell it like he sees it 
and to do that with a sense of humor and self-deprecation that I appreciate. So we got we got along pretty famously, and we've had a lot of exchanges kind of off the record uh, that are really fun. Mm. No, I, I agree with that about about David, and also what you were saying with regards to Australian and Canadians. I also think we don't mind, you know, poking fun um, and, and and mocking a little bit, you know, but in the interests of um, in the greater interests of change, you know, um, and and I think that's that's really wonderful. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if that interest in change is always like a conscious thing or not. I think, you know, for myself, uh, I think I just have a lot of trickster in me that <laughs> likes to, uh, by poking fun, poke holes in, uh, in something that seems to me like grandiose or inflated. And that could be uh, a cult, you know, a cultural thing, or it could be a person. Uh, but it, uh, it's gotten me in some trouble over the years. But I've, uh, come to appreciate it, that it does have a function that even my ego is not always aware of. Uh, mm. And I make sure that, uh, that I'm the subject of some uh, healthy poking every once in a while, you know? <laughs> well, well, I think we can agree on that, that the, the trickster energy abounds um, in both countries. There's no doubt about that. Um, so Brian, just let, let's take us a, a little step back and maybe, maybe for those that don't know of you, you and your work, you could maybe um, just take a moment to kind of explain um, what it is that you do in the world and, uh, and, and, and what you're bringing. Yeah. Well, uh, what do I do in the world? Hmm. Well, I try to be an advocate for soul first and foremost, and the way that that is expressed is a number of ways. So one of the ways that you mentioned is the podcast, and that's really sharing conversations that I have with people. Uh, that I'm interested in, like I said, at whatever stage on my journey, you know, where my interest is drawing me, um, I try to seek out people who have kind of been down that road before and might have something to offer. So the podcast was really an extension of my own kind of seeking and learning process. And I just felt that I had the opportunity to meet some really incredible people along the way, you know, uh, for whatever reason, um, I've always had this uh, ability to connect with people uh, who are, I see as kind of revered teachers, um, people of wisdom. And it just felt like a kind of uh, a, a repayment to then share those conversations with others who might also be seeking. Uh, so that's one way. Um, and like I said, that's really intertwined with my own journey. Um, so that's a big part of it is just sharing uh, my journey and these conversations I have with people. The other way is working with people one-on-one -on -one as a, I think of it as a kind of a soul friend and guide. Uh, I've played with different terminology over the years, coach and counselor, uh, but those come with so much baggage and so much kind of um, professionalism. I really was inspired uh, reading John O'Donohue's book on Amkara and that whole concept of the kind of the, the soul friend. Um, that really resonates with me. And that's the kind of role I, I like to play uh, in other people's lives. You know, just uh, as someone on the path who might be just a few further steps along who can maybe point some things out uh, along the way you know, as you travel your medicine path, just go, hey, you might want to watch out for that or, hmm, you know, that fruit over there is pretty tasty. You might want to try that for yourself. You know, mm. I often think about uh, like a jungle guide. Mm. You know, I visited places like Costa Rica and South America. And if you're venturing into a jungle that you don't know, it's good to have a guide, uh, someone who knows the territory <laughs> really well and, knows what to point out, uh, both the pitfalls and the fruits along the way. Uh, so that's kind of how I see myself in that role. And, and then maybe the other way is uh, through my artistic and creative expression. So the writing and music making that I do, um, I try to contribute some, some beauty to the world. Yeah, and then just trying to be a good neighbor, really, you know, to the people around me. 
Wow, well, that's, that's always that's, maybe that's maybe the biggest challenge, actually. <laughs> yeah, I think I think yeah, I resonate with that. But that's 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 beautifully articulated, um, brother. I, I appreciate that. And you know, when you talk about the friend, it kind of um, it reminds me of this, the great Sufi poets in talking about the friend. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that kind of that kind of idea of of the soul, or at least a, a guide a guide of the soul. It's a beautiful thing. Um, Mm -hmm. So thank you for everything like you a, do. A, a companion even, right? Just to have somebody else there with us on our journey, you know, as we go through these peaks and valleys, right? Mm -hmm. Like Rumi, you know, you mentioned the Sufi poets. Rumi, I mean, God, Rumi's the best, isn't he? Like, he's just like a, uh, uh, a field guide for the soul or something. And he had his friend Shams, uh, mm -hmm. who he, he met and... Um, you know, someone who offered him counsel and guidance. Mm. Uh, so I think we all need that. And um, it can be hard to find, you know, mm. so I try to just make myself available. And that's how it started for me. Mm. It's just going, look, I'm here. This is the work I'm doing. This is what uh, I've been through. Um, if you need some companionship, here I am. Mm. Well, I love that. I love that brother. And you know, it's interesting, you know, picking up on that Rumi thread that uh, it was when Shams died that, uh, you know, Rumi's heart kind of broke open and all those beautiful words poured out. It, it was mm. grief, you know, it was the beginning of his kind of soul, soul descent, wasn't it? So um, uh, mm. I think the whole thing is just such, such a beautiful weaving, you know, I guess he entered the dark forest that, that, uh, that he talked about earlier, the jungle, you know, um, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And um, well, in the in that friendship with Shams, actually, another one of his poems comes to mind, or, or a little piece of it, uh, out beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there's a field, I'll meet you there. And that to me points to, you know, it's kind of a guiding principle in um, the counseling or mentorship work that I do. It's to try to meet people in that field out beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing. So beyond judgment in a, a place of the heart of acceptance um, uh, to meet each other there so that uh, we can learn how to be ourselves in relationship, which I think is the big goal. You know, Jung called it individuation, which is a bit of a stodgy term and uh, has maybe too much of the individual in there. Uh, but I, I think for me, what that means is, um, you know, the goal of all of this inner work for me is so that I can actually be my authentic self in relationship with others, which is the big challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm hiding out in my uh, little hermitage here in my yogic cave, no problem. I can pretend that I'm just being myself and I'm fully authentic. But as soon as I enter into relationship with another person, uh, that's where it's the hardest to maintain that authenticity. Um, and, you know, I think for each of us, uh, different kinds of relationships bring that out more, the challenge of that. And for me, it's, uh, it's been with other men. Um, men were the source of my deepest wounds early on. And so uh, really working to be in healthy relationship with other men has been uh, maybe the most profound part of my own healing journey. Hmm. Well, maybe you could talk a bit more about that, Brian, because I know you offer um, um, courses and, and, and containers, you know, for, for men to do the work. And I'm, I'm also um, kind of uh, piggybacking on that idea about it being a place also, you know, out in that field beyond right and wrong. That's, that's where we can come together as, as men, where there's no judgment. Um, and we can just be and we can share our stories um, in a safe way, but in a brave way. Mm hmm brave way because perhaps uh out in that field beyond the ideas of right doing and wrong doing now i think that's important is that we're talking about ideas of right doing and wrong doing so those are really um cultural ideas around morality i think um maybe there is something you know closer to uh a, a truly right and wrong and, and how do we discern that for me the way to discern it is it's is it serving life or is it kind of destroying life you know that's like the fundamental morality for me uh, that i can judge most any action from and feel like i'm in a in, in a good place because i don't think we need to we should throw out judgment 
Uh, and so part of that being in that space with other people, men in particular, is also calling out uh, some kind of behavior or belief systems that are not contributing to the, the good and the beautiful, you could say, or not uh, supporting life in its most creative and nourishing aspects. So that's, I think, where the bravery has to come in, the bravery to speak up if we, if we see something wrong and the, the bravery to receive that and to self-reflect mm. and to question, you know, maybe this isn't the best thing to think or to express or to do, right? Mm. So just to make that disclaimer. Um, now, sorry, what was your question? Well, let me let me reframe it a little. Your your um, the men's work that you offer, I guess, is is, is where right. I was I was um, orientating us. But you 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 work archetypally a lot, don't you? Um, with king, warrior, magician, lover, and and those spaces. So I'm interested, and in perhaps the men listening might be interested in in how how that kind of functions for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, hmm. I had done different kind of forms of men's work over the years and uh, gone to different men's circles and things like that. Uh, and I think those can be really good because those can challenge us in all kinds of different ways. Uh, but for me, the way that I work at this point, anyway, I really like the one-to-one -one work. Um, I think that can really help us to get down to the core of things more quickly. Uh, so that's what I've been doing for the past few years. And yeah, I, I did develop a course based on Robert Moore's work, uh, that is for individual men and, um, it's, it takes place over six weeks. And so there's a lot of reading and listening. That's a part of that. So there's an educational aspect about it too, because I think particularly the King Warrior Magician Lover model that Robert Moore presented is a really helpful way for men to begin to self-reflect and to orient themselves. Um, it's just really useful. I mean, I don't take it always so literally. I don't uh, try to, I try not to be confined by that model because of course there's many more archetypes that are alive in us. Uh, but I think he did a really good job at identifying these four key archetypes in the masculine psyche. Um, so he already laid the groundwork. And, you know, I looked at maybe coming up with my own model um, and things like that, but I just felt like there is something in the continuity of picking up where he left off in that work. And of course he wasn't doing that work alone. He was doing it alongside people like Robert Bly and, and Michael Mead in particular. Um, and so there, there was something good about that that felt good about that is the continuity, picking up where some of our elders had left off. And so part of that is when I work with men individually is really making sure that we bring it on home uh, in their actual lives um, and not get lost in the, the theoretical, the abstract, which I think is one of the pitfalls for a lot of men, especially the men who come to this work, they generally have a lot of magician in them. That's one of their main sources of power. A lot of the guys who are interested in self-development work because the magician archetype is the one who leads us into the work. It's the part of us that wants to know and to understand, um, to figure out, to um, learn different systems and things like that. So, the magician archetype is the one who kind of leads us with curiosity into the work, but it can also block us in the work by getting really caught up in the theoretical. So, like I said, part of the program that I've developed for men is the learning part, which satisfies that magician uh, desire for knowledge and accumulating information and all of that. But then, uh, you know, my work, and this I can do really well on a one-to-one -one basis, is to help take men um, 
help bring it down to earth for them mm -hmm. into their particular lives and circumstance and talk about their relationships, uh, you know, with their lover, their spouse, their kids, their, um, their workmates, you know, whatever's going on in their life. And that's where that challenge part of it comes in. Uh, mm -hmm. cause it's easy for us to stay in the abstract and the theoretical and talk about all these really wonderful, rich Jungian ideas. But when it comes to applying them to ourselves and really taking an honest look at ourselves through this archetypal lens, that can be a lot more difficult and challenging to the magician who wants to remain kind of detached from it all, you know, and analytic. Um, that's, that's easy. And that comes naturally to a lot of us guys. So. Well, it's interesting because, um, and thank you for, for those words, because they, a lot of what you just said lands really deeply with me and also what I've experienced over the years in, in men's work. It really, I really feel that. Um, and it's interesting mm -hmm. you use the word analytic, um, you know, even, even the etymology of that word, which means to sort of take out of the collective and, and, and forensically look at. So it almost means to separate. Mm -hmm um so. it does mean to separate exactly mm. and uh you know i work with the tarot um i think it's just a, a beautiful collection of archetypal images they can help ground some of these ideas into an image which you know people like jung and james hillman especially thought was very important uh, uh because the psyche speaks in images it speaks in images through our dreams and our fantasies and imagination and so having a, a kind of uh, a book or repertoire of archetypal images, whether they're through cultural stories or things like that, is really important for us to, again, bring it down to earth. Mm -hmm. And in, so one of the first cards in the major arcana of the tarot deck is the magician. You know, it's like there's the fool, there's the magician. So the magician is the beginning of the work. And if you look at that image in the classical decks like the uh, tarot de marseille he's got a, a table in front of him his like little alchemic alchemic alchemists or magicians work table and he's got a collection of objects in front of him and he's kind of uh looking at these objects so there's that analysis is the taking apart the separating out um and in alchemy that's the first stage too is the separation stage because when we come to this work where what the alchemists called the uh, massa confusa, the confused mess, it's like a congealed ball of memories, experiences, traumas and gifts all like in some you know, confused ball. And so the way we have to begin is by like separating things out, putting them on the table so that we can have a clear look at them and decide, you know, what needs to be discarded, what needs to be nourished, what needs to be transformed, all of that. But until that separation happens, uh, there's not a lot of hope for us. So that's where it needs to begin. And I think that happens in my work through the dialogue that I have with people. It's like listening to their stories and, and through listening to their stories, listening to some of the patterns of speech underlying that are kind of conditioned belief systems at work. And I'll just notice things. Little things will tend to jump out at me and I'll go, hmm, you keep saying this word or you describe that in this way. Can we just take a little pause and look at that? And so we, we pull out that little piece, we put it on the table in between us. We have a look at it together. You know, if it's a belief, we go, you know, does this really hold up to any scrutiny, this belief that uh, has just become like an unconscious pattern in you. And we look at it and oftentimes it's actually no. Now that we like pull it out and we look at it, it, it doesn't feel true to me. Maybe it felt true to me 20 years ago, but it no longer does. And so that can be transformed or discarded or burned up, whatever needs to be done with it. Uh, but that's, that's how it happens for me is through the dialogue and paying and paying attention and noticing and just having the guts to maybe interrupt someone and go, mm, I'm getting a little, I call it, uh, I get the, the yellow flag. It's like the warning, like something in me comes up like a little caution and it's asking for a pause, like the yellow light on a traffic signal. It's like, Ooh, let's, let's slow down here. Let's like be cautious. Let's take a look around. Uh, 
yeah wow yeah um again um really feeling into a lot of that it, it makes a lot of sense you know um and 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 as it happens um brian we're actually working with the the tarot this year and we uh, through one of our uh, through our story session, um, which we hold weekly. And um, mm. obviously it was the full um, in January and, and we're working with the magician this month. So um, to hear you talk so eloquently yeah. about the magician is um, is bang on target for us. So thank you. Oh, great. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kind of following I've been thinking about doing the, that. Oh, I've been we're following the lead. doing that too. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, that's great. Sorry, we're talking over the top. This is more of an Australian experience now, what we call yarning. We, we, we talk over the top of each other. <laughs> it's just more awkward over this uh, particular medium, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I was going to say that um, we, we're actually following the lead from the Joseph Campbell Foundation, who, who are doing the same thing with their essays and writing this year. So um, it's, oh, it's been a pleasure. I didn't know come. that. Yeah. Yeah, there's another example of the collective unconscious at work, right? Because January started up, uh, my wife's doing a course with Sharon Blackie, and she's using the fool's journey uh, as a guide through this course. And it's a guide through the major arcana of the tarot. And every month, I think they get she gives out uh, one or two new uh, cards to contemplate and reflect on. Uh, and I was like, hmm, that's a really great idea. I think, you know, I should start doing that. And then now you tell me that you guys are doing that this year. Joseph Campbell Foundation is doing it. So there again, it's just like, ah, it's amazing. It, it feels good when you hear that, doesn't it? There's something, some part of you, which kind of, it's almost like there's a release, the shoulders drop and you're like, there's, there's something there. I, I understand something now. Well, it's, I understand that I'm not alone in this. You know, that like I am connected to these other people. And until we reveal something of ourselves, you know, what we're interested in, what we've been thinking about, what's uh, lighting us up at the moment, we may not know that there's this other connection. So in, that's one of the gifts of the vulnerability and the opening up of oneself and sharing with others is you find out, oh, I'm not alone in this. Other people are being guided toward this too. Uh, we're all part of some greater process. And then for me, it's like the affirmation of that. And it also offers some encouragement, like, hmm, that was a good instinct. Other people are like already, and for me, it doesn't get into uh, competition. You know, I don't think, well, those guys are already doing it. And, you know, I've got such a small following compared to the Fifth Direction or the Joseph Campbell Foundation, like, uh, what's the point, you know? But mm. for me, I get more of the encouragement of that. Like, no, no, take care of your little corner of the world over here, you know, with this like bigger idea that other people have picked up on as well. So yeah, it's kind of exciting. No, I, I like that. And, um, you know, uh, an affirmation for me, for example, when you were talking about King Warrior Magician Lover, because that's something that we also use as a part of our kind of container for men too. And, um, you know, I, I can see, some of the areas where perhaps, you know, and, and I can feel the criticism from those that might, might look at it with more of that, you know, magician's eye sometimes and try to pick it apart analytically. And as you said, you know, there are more archetypes and, you know, maybe it's not a good idea to sort of codify the archetypes so precisely, but I 100% agree with you. It's such a great foundation um, mm -hmm. to, to use. And, um, and the idea of kind of picking up the baton um, from those men you know, Moore and, and Robert Bly and Michael Mead and so forth. It just feels so good in my bones. Um, so, um, and I appreciate so much everything that they've done in, in more ways than I could explain in this conversation. Um, so it just, it just feels mm -hmm. so, so, so right to me. Yeah. And I mean, having some appreciation for all the work that they've done, wouldn't the thing that they would want most from us, wouldn't the best way to honor their work is to be to continue it I, and not just regurgitate it because some of that stuff is a bit outdated. You know, it's it just, you know, these are guys from a different generation. So they had a whole different set of cultural reference points. You know, like when Robert Moore talks about the, the warrior, for instance, he talks about like the movie Patton, uh, about General Patton, the American general. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know about that guy. 
I don't really care to learn so much about him. You know, he's part of the whole American war machine. And like, I'm going to find other, uh, uh, other expressions of the warrior archetype that speak to me and, and people of my generation, perhaps. And that's going to broaden it some more. And I think just naturally start to update the work, or at least the references that we use in order to bring the archetypes alive, you know, for people. So like, you know, for instance, the Lord of the Rings trilogy is full of these great archetypal figures. And uh, it's a really wonderful modern myth that sprang from the same source as the, the myths of old. You know, I think Tolkien especially was really deeply connected to the archetypal realm. And unlike something like Star Wars, which is also pointed to as a great kind of archetypal reference point, for Tolkien, it wasn't a conscious intention to make an archetypal story. George Lucas talked to Joseph Campbell and said, I want to make something that resonates for modern people. I want to make a modern myth. And Joseph Campbell gave him like the rundown of the hero's journey archetype and Lucas followed that and the storytelling and everything. Like it was very calculated to kind of uh, hit all those, hit all those buttons, you know. Whereas with Tolkien, it just sprang forth from his unconscious. I mean, a whole language system came out of it. A whole uh, mythological culture with songs and poems and you know a history unto itself. And he was just like uh, dictating really from the unconscious. So therein lies the difference for me. Um, you know, what's a true myth and what's not. Uh, when it comes from that deep source and you're just struggling to keep up. I mean, the amount of writing that he did, it was just obviously pouring forth through him and everything in his life had prepared him to be the um the dictator of the story or the, the scribe maybe is the better word, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, so yeah, taking the work of those guys, continuing it forward, letting it be refreshed along the way. So not getting uh, so rigid around them as authorities and experts and kind of concretizing the work, which for them was always evolving and always alive. So like, let's keep it alive. Let's keep, uh, you know, reflecting back and see where these archetypal figures that they were talking about, where they're showing up for us in the here and now, you know, keep it relevant. That's what's meant to happen, I think. Mm, no, I, I agree. Um, and I think, you know, for me, you know, one of the things that I've admired about following your work is you, you um, how much you've kind of tracked um, the work of, of, I guess, the, the mythopoetic guys, you know, all, all the way back. It's, um, it, it's wonderful. You know, it really feels like you've got, um, um, you, you're looking closely, you know, um, and, and picking mm. up all the pieces. And I think that, that, you know, kind of leads into how we started to communicate with one another, which was around your work in archiving um, those sort of um, hidden forgotten lectures from the Alabama men's conference. And, uh, you know, I really felt mm -hmm. something in, in, in listening to the passion in your voice and kind of, um, doing that work, which, you know, it's certainly not going to be, um, anything that's going to bring you any financial reward, but it feels like it's part of your purpose and part of your, you know, what, what you're bringing, um, your gift to, um, those that are following in the footsteps of, of those, those men. So I wanted to say thank you for that, but also mm. maybe offer you the opportunity to talk a little bit about what you're doing in that space. Oh, sure. Thanks. Thanks for noticing. <laughs> that feels good just to have you like notice and appreciate something I've been doing kind of on the side, like, cause you said, it's a, uh, it's a labor of love. Um, well, you know, I think for my whole life, I could safely say I was always interested in archaeology and anthropology of like kind of digging through the bones of our ancestors. And being a person who was born in Canada and second or third generation here, there's not a lot of bones of my ancestors here. 
And um, because of the nature of my family being quite fractured, uh, it's been really hard to do the archaeology through my personal lineage, you know, the bones of my actual ancestors. It's been a really difficult task. Um, and I may have gotten as far as I could going back three generations only, which there's a lot of grief around that. But uh, along the way, what I, what I came to realize was that we all have kind of spiritual ancestors, people who may not be blood related to us, but whose work, whether that's creative work or scholarly work, it speaks to us on the level of the soul. It resonates with our bones. And I've been able to identify a handful of people who came before who, when I read their work, I feel that resonance. You know, it's like my bones start humming. And every time I go back to their work, it's like I, I get re-nourished by it. You know, there's still some food for my soul there. So it's been really important for me to honor those spiritual ancestors by learning about them, um, trying to get to know them if they're dead through the people who knew them. Uh, and really it's like, yeah, their work having like a special place in my library. Um, and so meeting someone like John Lee, who's one of the people who was there at the beginning of the so-called men's movement in the eighties and nineties, a close friend and a student, I think of Robert Bly and also getting to meet Michael Mead, who also was closely involved in all of that, uh, hearing their stories and then also hearing their stories about Robert Bly who passed and the years before he passed, he uh, was, you know, he had dementia and so he wasn't, uh, he wasn't public, he wasn't speaking anymore. So basically unavailable. Um, that's felt really important to me personally, just getting to know these spiritual ancestors as well as I can. And the same, I went through the same thing with my yoga lineage as well. Um, and I don't do it for any other reason that it feeds my soul. You know, it helps me feel connected to something greater. Uh, to this lineage that I'm just like the kind of most current expression of in this one particular branch, you know, in this place and time. Uh, and it's just nice to hear that other people appreciate that too. It's, it's a very small amount of people. Like you said, it's never going to make me rich, uh, but it feels like a way to honor the dead, you know, and those who have, and I laid the soil that I draw nourishment from, you know? And so part of it is keep tending to that soil, keep the, their work alive in the way that I talked about before. Um, not holding them up as like uh, kind of religious icons, you know, the way that Carl Jung has and the way people will want to do with figures who make such an impact on them and the culture. Uh, but really trying to just understand them as human people, mm -hmm. accepting that they, uh, none of them are perfect, but they were tapped into something that is contributing to the greater human culture mm -hmm. in honoring that, you know? Yeah, that's um, beautifully said. Um, really, I, I, I feel that, you know, um, and, and um, uh, particularly admired uh, the way you handled um, the passing of, of Robert Bly and those beautiful tribute um, conversations that you have with the likes of Michael and John and, and Martin Shaw and and others mm -hmm. it was just um, beautifully well handled and I've actually found myself going back to those more than once which mm -hmm. is which is which says something um, plenty of things to well, listen to but, out there <laughs> yeah well, well there is that's for sure but I'm interested in like what keeps you going back like uh, what does it give you yeah, it's, it's very similar to, to the words you were using earlier. Um, it's almost um, it's almost like I need to rehear some of the things um, that were said um, to understand more about about his life. Some of the stories that were shared about you know Robert's early life, and it gives you a bit of a it gives you such a great insight into a man who means so much to me, who I consider a mentor, who 
who I never met, you know. So there's all these little kind of breadcrumbs that, that get dropped in those conversations with men that were around him um, a lot. You know, um, it, 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 I feel like bringing up, you know, Walton Stanley and, and Tim Young, who, who, who are obviously very early, um, very early um, names and faces with the Minnesota Men's Conference and having them come and speak to our men once a month at the Fifth Direction is just beautiful because they drop all these little anecdotes and, and, um, and things that happened. I know you've had them on your podcast as well. So you might feel some of that, but that also helps mm -hmm. us feel connected, you know, all the way back into, into those roots, having those men's energy, their voices and, and, and their faces um, around us and, and listening to the, the old stories. It's just, it, it really fills me up in the most beautiful way. And I know in speaking to the men in our community that they feel similarly. So um, yeah, mm -hmm. that's, I guess that's all part of it. Let me, let me check with you on this. Uh, this is something, you know, that it gives me hearing those anecdotes, you know, people who are close, like physically close to that person. And having spent time with, you know, one person in particular, an early yoga teacher of mine who took me under his wing and took me around the world and all of that, um, getting to see who he was off stage, you know, was really revealing to me and instructive. And so one of the things that I get from these personal anecdotes um, is a humanizing of someone like Robert Bly, who we're talking about. Uh, and that, what that does is kind of um, take the icon off the shelf in a way, which for me is important to always remember that this is a, this is a real human man with his own limitations and struggles, as well as all of those gifts, but they're not lo lose sight of the, uh, the, the other aspects, right? Um, that, so that kind of takes the icon off the shelf. What it does also is encourage me, you know, because I know most intimately all of my own limitations and foibles and idiosyncrasies and all of that. And if I don't remember, or if I don't even know of the more kind of human aspect of some of these figures, I'll tend to uh, maybe not be so willing to share the gifts that I have, because I might think I'm not worthy. Like, who am I to talk about this? You know, I've got all these problems in my life and I've got still so much work to do. And like, ah, oh, who am I to, to talk to people about these things or to, you know? So that's a big part of it for me too, is the, the humanization, the relatability. It also serves as a kind of encouragement, you know, um, that you don't have to be a, a perfect person, completely integrated, all those other fantasies that uh, we can be blocked by, uh, blocked in sharing the gifts that we do have to offer, you know, maybe the little, ooh, the little bits of wisdom that we might have picked up along the way or might have, you know, blossomed in our own soil, you know, that are unique, like, oh my God, can you imagine you might actually have a unique bit of wisdom to share with the world, just like a Robert Bly or James Hillman or Michael, Michael Mead or whoever, you know, a roomie. Mm -hmm. Just imagine that you might have something in you that is, that is bursting through the soil at this particular time and place for a reason. Mm -hmm. You know, a bit of wisdom that Robert Bly or Michael Mead or whoever couldn't have had because they weren't you growing in the soil in which you were planted, right? Like what an, what a terrifying, but liberating idea to just ponder that you might have something really unique and original to offer the world. Mm. And isn't it interesting? how many times do you get told that growing yeah, up? Yeah, <laughs> I know that's right, Brian. And, and, you know, isn't it interesting that that, understanding um of, of of what's possible for you comes from looking at the imperfection of the people that you look up to not 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 their kind of not not the other side of it all the beautiful amazing things they say when they're tapping into their genius it's actually looking at them as just a regular human being and seeing some of their flaws and imperfections that makes you realize all that 
So um, I think well, I think that's what wonderful. It, what it can do having the, having a more complete picture of the person can kind of dim the light enough emanating from that figure that your own light can then find a place in the world because otherwise it's just blinding and you're just dumbfounded by it you're kind of arrested by it you're stopped from doing your little piece of work in the world maybe right i think that's a pretty common experience for a lot of people mm. you know so i'm saying like see them as human beings you know it dims the light a little bit maybe so that that little ray of light from in your soul can shine into the world because it's there and it's meant to be shone into the world. Otherwise you wouldn't be here. Hmm. End of you story. Know, yeah. You know, one of the um, little documentaries that I saw, which really um, um, taught me that lesson was a literary friendship. Um, and it's a, the conversation between Robert Bly and, and William Stafford. And it's very raw. It's very, you oh. know, it almost looks like that they're, they're not even aware that the camera is in the room at some points. And they're just, Wonderful. They're just and they're just, they're just, you know, shooting the shit and, and being a couple mm -hmm. of guys. And um, it's it just, you know, uh, me looking up to to Bill Stafford as a poet and, and, and obviously everything around Robert Bly, just to see two guys just talking like that. And it just it just again, it just made it made me realize what's possible for me um, and all, all, all in all yeah. the ways that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Bly, I mean, this is one of the reasons why he's got a very prominent place on my tree. You know, James Hillman talked about the idea that we all need to find out what tree we're on. Um, and that will help us navigate all of the all of the books, videos, all of the the stuff out there. You know, if we start doing this kind of work, we're inundated with uh, with teachers and experts and um, traditions, practices, all of it. It's just too much. It can be overwhelming. So a great first step is to just start to figure out who's on your tree. Like when you read that person or listen to their voice, does it start that humming in your bones? You know, do you feel that resonance? Are they some kind of spiritual ancestor or brother or sister? Um, start to figure that out. So Bly's got a prominent place on my tree for the reason you just described. Uh, he was so natural and human and willing to show himself, you know, uh, he never to me came across as an authority or expert. He was always engaged in wondering aloud with other people. And I go back to those conversations all the time too. There's some uh, great ones that he did with a guy on a radio show called uh, new directions. And you can get these on, uh, audible and i was just re-listening to a couple of them and very much he's engaged in a conversation with this person who's supposed to be interviewing the expert and he's asking him his opinion on things and like well you know like what do you think about this and and i just love that uh it just dismantles the whole idea of the the expert and the authority which in my opinion we just have far too much of these days so i find it very refreshing and encouraging like just be yourself don't try to be the expert. Don't try to be the know-it-all. Uh, mm. Just be curious and open about the curiosity. You know, I, I love that. I, I love that, Brian. There, there was there's one particular moment in, in one of those interviews that I, I remember so clearly, and and Bly was telling a, a story or a piece of a story, um, and, and when he finished it, there was just a pause, and he just said, "I have no idea what that means." <laughs> 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 and it's like just this wonderful moment, you know um yeah yeah he, he was just curious and and that's a beautiful thing so brian i'm, I'm noticing that the, the time and, and it's been beautiful um chatting with you but you know in coming to a conclusion i, I wanted to ask you kind of where, where next you know where what's alive in your heart right now and um and and where are you um where are you feeling drawn yeah thanks and when uh when you propose the idea that you have me on to talk about my work you ask that question, what's alive for you right now? Um, and my response was a typical response from me. It's like, well, I'm not, who cares about what's alive just in me, right? I'm more interested in finding out what's alive between us. Uh, and so I kind of put it back on you as the host, like you lead this and like, let's not go in with an agenda. It's that coming from that kind of place. Uh, but then that your question um, kind of like, 
kept working on me. And then I think a couple of days later, I said, okay, well, look, I'm kind of interested in this particular subject right now. And maybe that's something we could explore. And you responded with, well, yeah, that's really interesting to us too at this time. So uh, <laughs> what I've been thinking about lately uh, is, okay, what's the way to set it up? I guess through my work with men particularly, but also with women and young men, um, it became really apparent to me that there was something that isn't being properly addressed in our culture or in the world of self-development and in men's work, I think. I could be wrong about that because I don't know everything that's going on out there, but just in terms of what I've been able to witness, we talk, there's a lot of talk out there about the hero's journey and initiation into manhood, right? There's been a lot of work done about that. It's all over the internet, all over people's Instagram posts and YouTube videos and everything. And then there's more work in the past few years around elderhood. Um, but for me, there hasn't been a lot of focus on what comes between those two stages. So what comes after the hero's journey of the initiation into full adult manhood, right? For us guys, you know, what does it mean to be a man and all of that stuff? Been a lot of work done around that. And then more and more work around uh, the kind of what Robert Bly called father hunger, um, hunger for elders, you know, guys of our generation have, I think, been taking that up more and more. Um, having come from, you know, what we call here in North America, the boomer generation, it was like really the me generation. Um, a lot of our older people, they retire. And in the true sense of the word is they retreat from culture, they retreat from community and society, and they go have an extended childhood in places like Mexico or Arizona or, or wherever, Florida. So it's left us with this real need and hunger for elders. But that still leaves that time in between in the middle age of a man's life. And we can tell that there's a need not being met by simply the um, disease, what they call diseases of despair. So the addiction, the depression, and suicide rates among middle-aged men are the highest of any other demographic. 70% of all suicides in the US in 2020 were middle-aged, quote unquote, white men. You know, the people who are supposed to be at the top of the heap, you know, according to kind of dominant narratives right now. Well, obviously that's not the case. Something's going on there. And so the question that arises for me is what's missing in a middle-aged man's life that would cause him to uh, descend into addiction and depression and suicide. And I think it's a lack of guiding stories for that stage of a man's life. So I, I was thinking about it and uh, <laughs> looking around, you know, like, have any of our elders really talked about this? And I found that anytime somebody of the previous generation anytime they talked about mentorship, it was all, always about what it gave the young man and the necessity for mentorship in a young man's life. But it's clear that uh, these middle-aged men are really at risk. So we always talk about at-risk youth and helping them out and all that. But what about the at-risk middle-aged man who obviously is lacking a sense of purpose and meaning in his life? Otherwise, we wouldn't have the addiction and depression and suicide, right? Mm -hmm. So we're starting to set this up, like there's a missing need here for a guiding story, you know, and at the, at the root level of the story is always an archetype. So what's the archetype that uh, is missing at this stage of a man's life? So 
following that, you know, I've started to get a sense, well, I think it has something to do with what's been called the wild man archetype, which immediately brings up all of these different images and ideas. Many of them, I think, are misleading. So I'm interested, you know, when I mentioned, you know, I, I'm curious about maybe exploring the wild man archetype. Just immediately, what does that bring up for you? What kind of associations do you have to this term? Yeah, I mean, for me, it, it's probably um, around, you know, reconnecting to my primal side. Um, you know, I, I start thinking about um, Martin Shaw's work around the wild twin, you know, this, this part of me that I've kind of left out um, in the forest to fend for itself, which is kind of um, full of my, my wounds, in a sense. Um, and, um, and obviously, clearly, um, the story of Iron John. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the hairy wild man in the woods. Correct. At the bottom who, of the, uh, the bottom of the and, lake. Yeah. Yeah. Who's been submerged in the, in the pond out of sight, out of mind. Um, that's where I was led to is thinking about particularly Bly's work around um, the wild man, Iron John, Iron Hans. Uh, the thing about him though, is he's still pretty wild, right? Like in the wild man in uh, different cultural stories and depictions was often seen as uh, not a part of community at all. I mean, he was literally a man living like a wild beast in the forest. And if we think about a figure like Pan, uh, he's keeping something alive, keeping something of the wild alive, but not integrated into the community because he's just too wild, but he's there. And maybe once a year, they would have a festival where they'd invite the wild man into the festival, just as a reminder that uh, at our core, we are still wild, but not integrated, you know, allowed in once a year. <laughs> uh, and so I think, you know, what I've been kind of getting to is that there's, the wild man is maybe one stage in what needs to happen in a man for him to be a mentor. And so I've been focusing in more on the mentor as a, as a role, as an archetypal figure and doing some wondering about that. You know, what is it that makes a mentor? Uh, what does the man acting as mentor get from the mentoring relationship? You know, we know what the, what the young man gets from it. We know what need is being filled there, but I'm saying that the, man acting as mentor gets something necessary from that relationship as well. Something that will give him that sense of purpose and meaning in his life that will keep him from falling into absolute uh, disrepair. Mm. So I think reclaiming the inner wild man, that part of it, that's, a, that's an aspect of it. But I think uh, he has to evolve somewhat so that he can be actually integrated into the community. So when I think about the wild man, I immediately associate it with those stories surrounding the men's movement of the eighties and nineties, you know, people from the outside hearing about it and just picturing men getting naked in the woods, playing drums and screaming and shouting. And that's not untrue. A lot of that did go on but there was a lot more going on. There was the kind of, um, there was a refining of that that happened actually when you really got into it. I mean, the, the true kind of primal wild man of the woods, he's not interested in poetry or, or music or anything like that. He's living like a wild animal, you know? It's not safe to have him in the village. Uh, so what happens when the wild man kind of evolves and uh, becomes more integrated in a man? I think what we get is the mentor. So looking at, uh, well, Lord of the Rings, for instance, Gandalf, classic mentor, and very much someone who's integrated the wild man. 
he's got a wild aspect to him. You know, he, where's Gandalf's home? We don't know. He's kind of wandering around. He's quite at home in the wild. Um, we see him shape-shifting, communicating with animals and creatures. Um, he's got that, but he's also uh, more refined. You know, he's able to come into the village and serve a role and, and all of that. Um, he's interested in more than just his own survival and thriving. You know, he's, he's got that elder quality in him that uh, is interested in upholding the good in all. You know, peace and harmony in the kingdom and all that stuff, right? So Gandalf, Gandalf is there. I got Gandalf in my sights going, hmm. But he's still, he's still kind of old. I don't know. Is he the old wise man? Hmm, I don't know. Uh, Merlin is another figure that I'm getting, I'm getting really curious about exploring more deeply. Uh, Merlin started out as a warrior in service to the king. When the king was killed in battle, the Welsh king, so this comes from the, the Welsh tradition around uh, Myrden or Merlin, after the king was killed in battle, uh, Myrden's grief was so great that he had to retreat into the woods. And he, there he went mad. So he went, he went wild, but he didn't stay there. You know, in the stories, he, uh, he then ended up being a mentor to young King Arthur. Um, so Merlin, I think, has got something to tell us there. There's a story to be told there for middle-aged men um, about the journey through grief, the retreat into the wild, uh, um, getting in touch with your natural side more, but then coming back you know, with something to offer. The other aspect of the mentor that I think about is uh, mastery. The mentor has gone through life. He's lived the first half of his life, gaining mastery in some area of life. Uh, he's done his 10,000 hours in at least one area. So he's got something valuable to pass on, to teach. So men who haven't got that, I'm not sure what they think they're offering, you know? Uh, so that's an integral aspect of the mentor is mastery. The, having integrated the, his wild nature, right? That's another piece of it. What else was I thinking about? I mean, maybe I had a couple more notes here. Uh, that, um, yeah, that he embodies authenticity. I mean, that's part of embracing the wild man is embracing your, your authenticity, right? Giving less fucks about what other people think about you. You know, how you dress, how you wear your hair, how you speak, all of that, right? I think that's a big part of it. The living outside of the village, or you know, we could think more broadly, living outside of culture, like just on the outskirts. You always find that in these stories. He's never so far out that you can't find him. He's just outside enough to not be conditioned or conform to the expectations of the civilization, mm. but he's close enough that you can access him. You know, me talks like about Michael the, the one foot in, one foot out, Brian. You know, one one foot in the, in the mm. domesticated, one foot in the civilized, and one in the un, uncivilized. That that's kind of where this mentor sits. You know, um, and I really yeah, like that like kind the, of image. Yeah, that's very much like the shamanic archetype: one foot in this world, one foot in the other world the ability to bring things back and forth between the two worlds, right? In, in The Water of Life, Mead tells a story, an, an old Irish tale about a young prince. And, um, you know, he's going through his kind of initiatory journey. And, you know, uh, apropos of the hero's journey and that whole archetype, he meets his mentor and he's a, a druid in the hut just on the outside of town, you know? So he's a kind of natural magician, like a shaman uh, living on the outside of town. And I think that's an important point because mentorship, I think needs to happen outside of the family home. It needs to be someone outside of that unit 
because another aspect of the mentor that I think is important is helping the younger person break free of the familial and cultural conditioning in order to find who they really are, right? So that person, the mentor has to be outside of that in order to challenge it. Um, if you're too close, let's say to the, the father and mother of the young person, uh, and you start challenging the status quo with that young person so that they can be free to be themselves and make up their own mind and all of that stuff, find their own path, mom and dad likely aren't going to be too happy about that, you know, because the young person may become more um, non-conforming and mm. disruptive to the family unit, right? Mm. But that needs to happen in order for the young person to discover their original medicine or their genius. Mm. So the, the mentor has to be just on the outskirts, right? So it they could also be, have to have the, less investment in, you know, the, the mum and the dad are, are, are too interested in, in, in their um, son or daughter's safety. You know, I think the, the mentor has less yeah. interest in their safety and more interest in their potential. And that means, you know, taking a few risks, which um, may not sit well with, with the parents. Well, and, and the parents have too much invested in their own ideas about right doing and wrong doing their dreams and expectations for this person they they see as an extension of themselves so for that young person to um be planted in their own soil and grow into you know their fullness there needs to be a severing of that you know that uh entanglement um and the mentor who's just outside of that bubble or, you know, is able to do that in some way and to encourage um, that person's growth. So these are some of the things I've been uh, thinking about lately and I want to develop it more. Um, there's not a lot. So I'm looking for work that has already gone over this. Michael Mead has been pretty good about that. Although again, he focuses more on what the young person gets from the mentorship. I don't know if he's seen the necessity for middle-aged men to be a mentor. Mm. So I'm looking into this right now. And I Mead, got a batch Mead of tea. A lot, um, Brian, Mead talks a lot about um, mentor himself in the story of Odysseus, um, who kind of plays that role, um, you know, just well, arrives on know, the scene walking up the beach. That's, you know, that's where we get the word mentor is from the Odyssey. Uh, but we don't know really much about mentor. Mentor was like an old man, an old wise man who people sought counsel from. Mm. Uh, he and was a sailor, really, wasn't he? Uh, I'm not sure. You know, there's mm. so many kind of stories in, you get into the Greek myths and you hear all kinds of little different tidbits about particular figures, but mm. I haven't been able to find out a whole lot about mentor. And I mean, he was really taking care of Odysseus's son uh, while Odysseus was off at war for 20 years, mm. you know, mm. is that more like caretaker than the kind of mentor I'm talking about? Like the Yoda figure who, yeah. when you're at this stage in your journey of individuation, you, you find them and they teach you something that's really important. They see your gift. They help draw it out of you. They encourage that growth. You know, that's something very specific, right? Yeah, I agree. Although, although mentor kind of fits the bill in the sense that he wasn't close to the family in that way. He just kind of appeared out of nowhere. Um, we don't know where he lived or where he was. He just, you know, um, he just was wandering up the beach, you know. <laughs> well, the way, the way I got the story uh, from my dictionary of Greek mythology was that Odysseus actually hired mentor to take care of his son while he was away. Oh, so there was a so, there was already a direct relationship there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I, I feel like he's more of like a caretaker. But mm. again, um, it's something I'm just kind of like exploring now. Mm. So anyway, that's that's kind of what's alive. But I think there's something really important about that. Like what are middle-aged men missing that's causing them so much despair? Mm. Uh, what story, what archetype isn't being um, held up and, and offered to these men? Mm. Well, there's, there's so much there that, that resonates with me, brother. So I really appreciate um, you sharing that, you know, kind of looking at 
what's on the edge of, of where you're going um, with your work. And I, I think that, you know, everything you said there um, makes a lot of sense to me, at, at least anyway. Um, you know, uh, uh, it's interesting because as you were speaking about um, kind of your thoughts on, on the wild man, I'm, I'm currently doing a lot of work personally with the um, with Gilgamesh um, and, and, and the idea mm -hmm. of um, Enkidu came up for me and whether he kind mm -hmm. of fitted, fitted that role um, in, in, in terms of the way you're perceiving the wild man. Um, which was interesting to me. Um, and the other thing that mm. came up was uh, Bly often talks about, you, you were talking about, you know, what, 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 does, what's, what does the mentor receive in, in this relationship? Um, and, and I often remembered Robert talking about, you know, the blessing goes both ways. You know, the mentee is blessing the mentor just as much as the mentor is messing the, uh, uh, blessing the, the, um, the mentee. So I think that that's... Um, really yeah. important to me to understand that the energy flows both ways yeah but what is the blessing the mentor is receiving you know like to use our magician analytical uh facility you know i get curious like okay it's just it sounds nice the blessing goes both ways oh how poetic oh i just want to like soak it up but i actually go hmm but what is the blessing here and so mm. let's try to understand that and for me, the way to understand it is to look at what, what obviously is missing for men at this stage of life, you know, mm. and what's causing them to commit suicide at higher rates than anybody else. Mm. So that's part of it, the purpose and meaning they get from the relationship. And that takes away any expectation of the young person to do some kind of blessing or acknowledgement of the mentor, right? It, it doesn't put that burden on them which mm -hmm. is something that I've seen can happen in some of these men's spaces is the young men end up having to bless these older men who haven't received a blessing previous to that relationship. So that brings up some, another essential aspect of a healthy, a good mentor in my books is they have to have undergone some kind of apprenticeship or mentorship of their own earlier in life and receive that blessing. Mm. No, I like in, that. In a, in a way that was just organic, um, you know, not as part of some like initiatory weekend, you know, gaze into this other man's eyes and give them the blessing they didn't get when, no, I don't think that actually works to be frank. Um, it's kind of play acting in some aspects. And I don't know, that may be controversial, but just from what I've seen, it has to have happened. So what I encourage men to do, and I, I can tell you every man I've ever met has received this blessing and probably just not recognized it because they were looking for something grand, like, you know, the way these things are built up in certain men's circles, right? The blessing of the elder and they maybe bring out the Excalibur sword and some older man puts in a, you know, I've seen all this stuff, right? It's kind of LARPing the blessing, uh, role-playing. Um, so here's what I encourage, and this is maybe where we can end it. Man or woman, whoever you are listening to this, go back through your history and try to identify moments of little blessings. So anytime somebody other than your mother and father saw something in you, saw the gold in you, admired it, drew it out of you, encouraged you to follow that talent or whatever it was, uh, I can tell you, you probably wouldn't be listening to this unless you had received that from someone. And it may have just been a little thing, you know, a little pat on the back, a little, a look, uh, a few words, but really try to sift through your history and identify some of those moments and just kind of separate them out for a little while and just hold them up and acknowledge them and just acknowledge them. Just start with that. I won't ask you to do anything more, but just look for those little moments, you know, the little mentoring moments in your life. And then what that will do is, you know, hopefully open you up to some gratitude um, an honoring of that person and that little gesture they made, but then may, it may also encourage you to offer out those little mentoring moments to others. 
Like it doesn't have to be a big thing. It's recognizing the gold in someone and just going, you know what, that's great. You know, I'd love to see more of that or some, you know, hmm. simple. Everybody can do it. And I think more people should. Hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you, brother. You know, I think you're right. That's a, it's a wonderful place to end it. So um, let me just say, uh, I, I've really enjoyed this, this conversation, Brian. I hope there are many more. Me too. And, um, yeah, you're supposed thanks. to do a half an hour and here we are an hour and a half later. So you must be <laughs> I know. going. I know I should have, we should have known that up front, <laughs> but thank you, brother. I, I really appreciate your time. Oh, I'm so grateful um, for you inviting me and to drawing some of this out of me, you know, some of these things that have just been kind of rattling around in my brain. Um, it's, it's really nice to have someone to, uh, you know, it's like we open up a channel and um, something can come forth in that channel and, uh, that's what this opportunity has been for me. And I'm really grateful for it. Hello, hello.